Welcome to Innovation Dialogue. I'm Diana Ding. Today we're with Palo Alto City Council, Greg Tanaka. Hey, Greg, how are you? Good, thank you. I know that you're running for Congress for District 16. That's correct. Yes, and you describe yourself as a nerd. <laughs> Why is that? Well, you know, if you look at my yearbook in high school, I'll probably be the kid voted most likely not to run for anything because I was very much into science and math, and it was only later in life that I actually got involved in politics. So for me, uh, I'm very data-driven. I, I'm not very partisan. I don't have incredible biases one way or the other. Um, when I look at an issue, I try to figure out what is the best win-win approach uh, versus um, have some sort of dogmatic ideal that has to be this way or that way. And in fact, if I find that uh, the data shows that one way is better than another, I'll pretty much change my opinion. So I tend to be very, very data-driven. I take, I take a very kind of analytical approach to making decisions. Mm -hmm. So you are running against a front runner. Yeah. So what is your win-win strategy? Yeah. This time. Yeah. So um, uh, f first of all, I, I definitely admire uh, the current incumbent. You know, uh, Shin Pashi has endorsed me, and I've endorsed her. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I, but I, I think we're at a very critical juncture in this country. I look at what Congress is doing. A lot of what Congress is doing is dealing with technology, whether it's privacy or it's cryptocurrency, or it's energy policy. Right now, Congress has made really important decisions about legislator, legislation for the digital age. Mm, that's your slogan. That's my uh, slogan, yeah. A leg legislator for the digital age. What does that mean? Why you choose this slogan? Well, because, especially for Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, a lot of the innovations are coming from Silicon Valley, and we need regulation that makes sense. Some of the regulation that's coming out, like, the infrastructure what, bill. What uh, not makes sense? Yeah. So like the infrastructure bill mm -hmm. that was passed last November had a provision in there that made it almost impossible to use cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. It basically made everyone in the cryptocurrency a broker. Another policy that I think doesn't make sense is right now we have an existential cri crisis with climate change. We have a, a drought that's the worst in 1,200 years. So I serve on the water board uh, for, for Santa Clara County. And so we, we're having to restrict the amount of water usage. We're jacking up the rates. And uh, what's causing this is climate change. We ha we're outputting too much carbon in the air. And what this is causing is hotter temperatures. And that means that the water, that the snow that falls in the Sierras, turns into water. We don't have a way to store the water. So what we need to do is we need to have concrete plans to actually solve the drought. Um, so uh, people have been trying to push to shut down nuclear power in United States. But nuclear power is totally carbon free. It's something that, if you look at the number of people that have died through nuclear, only maybe 100 people total from Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island have died in the total history of nuclear power. Um, versus, if you look at how many people die each year from the burning of fossil fuels, it's like, I think in, in 2018 it was 8 million people. So um, nuclear has been safe compared to fossil fuel. It's also less carbon. So you can use it to, um, to uh, uh, reduce the amount of carbon output. Because in California, during the day, we produce a lot more renewable energy, in fact, from solar and wind. In fact, more than we could use. But we don't have a good way of storing it. So what we do at night is we just burn natural gas, which puts more carbon in the air. So there's a study out of Stanford where their proposal is that we expand Diablo Canyon, which is a nuclear power plant, rather than shutting it down, which is what the, I think the incumbent wants to do. So instead of shutting it down, we expand it. And so during the day, we could use nuclear power to desalinate water. And then we have the right-of-way from the high-power transmission lines that can bring the water uh, through pipes to up here and also down to LA. So it's a way to solve the drought, as well as not putting more carbon to the air. And Diablo Canyon is kind of in the middle of nowhere, so it's, you know, even if there is an incident there, it's not near where people live. Have you talked to his, you know, the legislator or someone in charge there? This is a great idea, it sounds like. I, I, it's a great idea. In fact, I made a whole video on this. Mm -hmm. And um, if you go to my website, I have a bunch of endorsements from people around this topic. And it's, it's a way to really solve the problems. I think a lot of what people talk about is, is what I call rhetoric, right? There's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. There's not a concrete plan to solve the problem. And so I think the, the fundamental issue that we have is, um, is you have to have at least a basic understanding about what's happening, especially around technology because so much of what Congress deals with is around technology. But if you don't have that understanding, um, and I un understand if you're eight years old, you, maybe you're not using TikTok, you may not be using 
Um, you might have a really good understanding of nuclear power, but, but we're making decisions for not just this generation, for next generations. We're making decisions that are going to be impacting the whole planet. And so I think we need to make decisions that are data-driven, not just you know, whatever is politically popular at the time. Mm, data-driven, I think that's one of the issues. So there are so many issues, so what's your priority? Um, so climate change is a big priority. I think climate change, as I mentioned, is, is an existential threat. Mm -hmm. We only have one planet, and if you look at the temperature, it's rising. Um, you look at the drought, the drought is a manifestation of the climate change. Mm -hmm. You look at like, uh, the coast of California, like Pacifica, is falling into the ocean, right? So we have some real big problems here. Uh, so climate change is a big one. Um, education. So 30 years ago, the United States used to be number one in education, like the best in the world. And today, we're middle of the pack. But in order for our economy... Why is that? It's a good question. I think education, our quality of education, it's not so much our quality of education has fallen that much, it's that other countries have gotten a lot better. So you look at places like China or just about any other countries in the world, their education has gone better and better and better, higher standards, higher quality. I think what we need to do is provide high quality ed education for all. And you might think, well, that's too expensive to do, but you can't do that. You can do that through technology. And that's why I, I, I think we need legislation for the digital age. Just using the same techniques that people used to teach uh, kids 500 years ago or 200 years ago, when we have Zoom, when we have the internet, when we are able to do, do personalized um, education for people, it doesn't make sense. We could provide high quality education for everyone if you use technology, if we actually structure education better. But if we do it the same way that we always did it, it's impossible. You, cannot, you can't provide the high quality education that this country needs for everyone. Mm -hmm. And without that, then it leads to higher crime, it leads to more homelessness, it makes it tough for people to survive. So we need a really high quality education for all in order for this country to be successful. Mm -hmm. You are four times a uh, startup founder. So as an entrepreneur, you know, what does that really you know, impact for your decision as an elected official? Well, as an entrepreneur, and, and I, I know you're also an entrepreneur, yes. uh, I think entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of this country. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the S&P 500, um, the stock market, so much of it is made up of, of companies that never existed 30 years ago, 20 years ago, right? These are new companies. And I think you need that kind of innovation because if you don't have this kind of innovation, you're kind of stuck doing things maybe in a way that's less efficient. But with startups, it brings new ideas, a fresh perspective. Ming and Ling. How's that? Startup is Ming and Ling. Oh. You are actually, you know, I would say many of startups start from scratch. Yes. Always lack of money, that's lack right. of resources. Lack, lack of people, lack, lack of resources, yes. lack of brand. Yes. Um, and so is that the situation of your campaign now? Absolutely. So we're definitely a startup campaign. Mm -hmm. But I look at government. So during the day, I'm a startup entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. At night, I'm on Palo Alto City Council. And it's so contrasting, right? Mm -hmm. So Palo Alto, mm -hmm. like government in general, is very kind of slow moving, not terribly efficient. Um, it's, it has but been But you've been on the city council, and what has the, the you know, change you made? One of the reasons why I ran for city council mm -hmm. was um, the mayor at the time was trying to ban software development, mm -hmm. like coding. Uh, this is Silicon Valley. This is, this is where HP started. This is where uh, Google started. This is where Facebook started. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a software startup. And to me, trying to ban software development in, in Palo Alto made no sense. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I ran. So one of the first things I did when I got in city council was to make sure that software development was legalized. I think we want more innovation, not less. Because so often, what people are focused on is their slice of, of the pie. They want their slice of the pie to be bigger. And I think if we are able to use technology, we can make the whole pie bigger versus um, fighting over the same size pie. Because by using technology, we can increase productivity. Also, through better education, people's productivity increases. So I want to be focused on growing the pie versus just keeping the pie the same size mm -hmm. and just fighting over how big of a slice we get. Mm -hmm. Because I think I think that kind of, um, kind of zero-sum game, like if you thought about that as an entrepreneur, you would think everything's hopeless. But with entrepreneurs, we create something from nothing, right? Mm -hmm. We start when you have nothing. You able to make, I think you told me you started this studio with, with $3,000. $3, with $3,000, yes. and look what you have now, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it is amazing. And that's, that's the, if you had a zero-sum game of thinking that all I could have is this $3,000, but that's all I started with, you would have nothing. But entrepreneurs are able, are dreamers. We're able to turn dreams into reality. Mm -hmm. 
and unfortunately, a lot of people in politics don't have this kind of mindset. They have this、um, scarcity mindset that in order to help people, I got to take something from this person and give it to this other person. But an entrepreneur, we have this abundance mindset, right? We think that we could turn something, maybe nothing, into into something, right? And that's what you've done. That's what I've done. That's what so many other entrepreneurs have done. And this is also one reason why I'm running is because a lot of the policies being put in place by the current incumbent have made have made doing startups even harder, right? Whether it's the amortization of R and D spend or the immigration policies, it made it tougher for entrepreneurs, not easier. We should maybe make things easier for entrepreneurs. We want more entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs will work 80 hours, 100 hours a week, and a lot of them will not make it. But some of them do make it. And the ones that make it, like look at Elon Musk. He made he he made a reusable rocket. I mean, that's been a sci-fi dream for 100 years. But he actually did it, right?、Mm -hmm. And and that's what we need. We need people who can do the impossible. And and then unfortunately, a lot of people in government, they're not from a technology background. They're a political science. They're professional politicians. They never actually had to start something from nothing. All they could think about is, I could take something from here and move it over here, but that's not really helping. You, the way you help is you grow the pie for everyone. You make everyone more productive, so that we could all win. Versus just there's got to be winners and losers. Because so often right now in politics, there's this whole red team versus blue team idea, right? Maybe some of the blue team think, oh, we should reallocate, and some of the people on the red team think, oh, we want to just keep what we have. But it doesn't have to be like that. What, what could happen instead is. We can grow the whole pie so that everyone can win. So everyone can be more rich, right? Everyone can win. Everyone can become rich. It's really difficult because you know,、uh, I heard on radio、uh, yesterday when I was driving, and people were discussing about Elon Musk bought Twitter.、Mm. Actually, you know, there are so many very rich entrepreneurs、yeah. in the high tech industry.、Yeah. But how does that benefit the underrepresented people? And people, you know, really living in the poverty,、yeah. uh, because you know people are, you know, they're in a different field. Yeah, and people、yeah. can hardly get to really hear each other's yeah. voice. Yeah. So we see that, you know, high tech companies, so many high tech in in Silicon Valley,、yeah. they're very successful. But we also see so many small business struggle,、yeah. especially during the pandemic. Yeah. So what do you think that how can you know the high tech to benefit? To this underrepresented people. Yeah. So I th I think a lot of people view, at least some people view tech entrepreneurs as,、um, you know, not paying their fair share, right? Taking from everyone else and and <clears throat> and not helping, not benefiting society. But I think if you really look at it, first of all, most tech entrepreneurs are not that successful. You see the. You hear about Elon course, Musk. You hear about the Zuckerbergs. But most of them are small businesses yeah, struggling. They struggle, right? They、mm. they work. For very little, I would say ninety percent of them are not. Or, or more, or, or more, more, right? More, so、yes. they they take incredible personal risk,、mm -hmm. and you know a lot of them don't make it, right?、Mm -hmm. They can make more money working for someone else. Yes.、Um, but what happens though is it's a little bit like Darwinism, right?、Um, most of them won't make, will not make it, but some of them do make it, and when they do make it, they they bring incredible productivity to this country, right? So let's take example like in your area, media, right? Before, when you wanted to, to to produce a television show or produce a media, you would have to have incredible amount of capital, right? You couldn't just fire something up on YouTube, right? You couldn't just take out your cell phone and start vlogging, right? You you you're you need a whole crew behind you, right? Now you could create a whole news station with just one person, right? And there's people out there who have millions of followers, with just they have more followers than let's say NBC with just their their iPhone, right? So that that's what I mean. It's like the accessibility. Um, being able to、um, being able to create things at a much much lower cost is amazing. It's created a whole bunch of new kind of careers that people never could have before. And so,、um, but you know, the truth is, of course, it's not always even, right? There's some people who can't benefit from that, right? I think technology has lowered the cost for so many different things, whether it's you know、um, education. Well, not all education, but some like some education, like you know, software programming. There's like so many YouTube videos now. You can learn how to. I feel like I'm in the Matrix. In the Matrix, there's、um, this woman named Trinity. She, know how, she didn't know how to fly a helicopter, so she got the program downloaded into her head.、And、I feel like YouTube is almost like that. It's like you can learn just about anything through YouTube now.、Um, but I think beyond that,、um, the really important thing is that、um, this technology is, in general, increasing the productivity for everyone. Now, for the ones that、um, aren't able to adapt,、um, this is why I really think that we need quality education for all. So in some areas, quality of education, like in Palo Alto, is actually quite good, but in some areas, it's not good. And I, 
myself, I grew up, my, my dad never finished high school. He, you know, we kind of grew up in a really rough neighborhood. We didn't, Japanese American, right? Yeah, so my dad um, was Japanese American. So he, um, my great grandfather came from Hiroshima, like 1880. And then, um, and then uh, uh, during World War II, my great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad all got put into the internment camps. Uh, my, dad, uh, my dad was only six at the time, and his dad uh, died in the camps of tuberculosis. Um, they, they lost their family business. They had a grocery business, a wholesale, for, wholesale grocery business. And, um, and then when my dad got out of the camps, there was incredible anti-Japanese discrimination. I mean, they, if you were Japanese, it was bad news to be in California. Yes. And my dad used to get beat up just going to school. And uh, he told me that one time he went to school, he almost died. Like, they almost killed him. And so he dropped out of high school. And so he never got a high school diploma. And, and so we grew up really, really poor. And this is what I mean by equal opportunity, right? Um, like, I didn't have the best school district, right? But I was fortunate, I worked hard. I learned the value of education. And I was able to, I now live in Palo Alto, right? Which I would never, I mean, if you talk to me back then. It reaches the place. Well, yeah, I mean, I would, I would never dream that I could be in a place like that. Um, I mean, I remember uh, our house got broken into like five times. My sister and I had this, st my, dad, my dad was pretty handy. So he built this little storage bench and my sister and I were supposed to hide in there when people broke into our house. And it, was, it was pretty crazy. Um, now I look at my kids. My kids, like, you know, uh, they get a new backpack every single year. <laughs> you know, when I grew up, I had the same backpack from junior high through high school. And I had to patch it myself. I, I remember that backpack. I had so many patches. It was crazy. And um, so and that's why I think I'm a good entrepreneur. <laughs> because I know, how to do with very, I know how to do something with very, very little. Um, but I also think that as technology has been benefiting a lot of people, we need to also make sure that people that are less fortunate, because at one point in time, I was less fortunate. I had very little. I grew up in a really rough neighborhood. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get some, have some amazing teachers, some amazing opportunities that allowed me to be where I am today. And that's something I want to make sure that everyone has, right? No matter if, whether you live in Palo Alto or you live somewhere else, right? Or you, or you live where I grew up. Um, I think it's important that we give people the opportunity so that they can um, become educated so they can be successful. Mm -hmm. Talking about our next generation, and you also mentioned that you know, when you make decision, you're thinking about the future, yeah. our next generation. So yeah. what do you see in the next maybe 10 years or 50 years, and what kind of a society or what kind of world you want to, your next generation to live in? I would love, so the past 40, 50 years for the United States, since World War II, the country has, has has been top of the top of the world, right? Number one, right? And I would like that to continue. I'll, I I love this country. You know, I'm, I'm fourth generation Japanese American, um, second generation Chinese American. Uh, I've you know, I've had this rags to riches story. Um, I want this to be possible for everyone here, right? No matter, you know, what generation you are, no matter how rich or how poor you are. I wanted that to continue, but I worry about this because I look at inflation. Inflation is the highest in 40 years. I saw that the productivity of this country has dropped to lowest in, since 1947, right? I just saw that today on LinkedIn. 1947, the lowest productivity rate ever. Like, it went negative. And um, I, I see these storm clouds, and I worry about what does the future hold for our kids, our kids' kids. Um, you know, we've, we, were we were beneficiaries of World War II. We had you know, our, our, our country didn't get destroyed by the war. Um, and so we've, we've had you know, the, the benefit of being the global reserve currency, of being the superpower of the world. But I think without good decisions, that would not always continue. Without really great education, that's not going to continue. Without really great incentives to have innovation, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think that we can't take for what we have for granted. I, I realized like, for myself, when I looked at my background, if I took for what I had for as granted, I, I would not be where I am today. I had to strive for more. And I think for this country, we need to strive for more. Innovation, like what happens in Silicon Valley, this kind of innovation. I, I go all over the country and all over different parts of the world, and everyone wants to be Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. But um, when I'm in Silicon Valley, you have people who, mm -hmm. you know, they take innovation for granted. And I think that cannot be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. I, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you how hard it is. I mean, you as an entrepreneur know how hard yes, it is to be successful. It's very few of us make it. Yes. And so we need to have the support system to allow people to do this, mm -hmm. for a lot of people to take the risk 
to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly those doors are shutting and I want to keep those doors open. I want to mm -hmm. have the best and brightest here. I want to encourage us to invest in technology, mm -hmm. right, in R&D. Our, our, our investment in R&D has fallen a lot compared mm -hmm. to what it used to be. What do you think that government can do? Well, one thing is have reasonable regulations, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so like I'm in the crypto industry right now, and the regulations in there are basically going to shut down the industry. I look at mm -hmm. um, the incumbent. She's trying to ban recommendation engines. Mm -hmm. So like on YouTube, it says, if you watch this video, you should watch other uh, this other video. If you try to use the internet without a recommendation engine, like TikTok, it would be impossible. I mean, you have to use it chronological or alphabetical order. It's absolutely impossible. So we need someone that has some understanding about technology. Because if you don't, you have some really crazy decisions. And so I think we need to, in order for us to advance forward, we need to uh, not just do what's politically easy, but to do what's right, right? Mm -hmm. Something that's actually going to improve the country. And that's something that on city council, I've, I'm known as someone that's a very independent decision maker. I will study the issues backwards and forwards and then make a decision, even if it's not politically expedient for myself. Mm -hmm. Because I wonder, why do I serve, right? My point of serving isn't just to serve, isn't just to be in office. My point of it is to make the best decision for my constituents, mm -hmm. even if I don't benefit politically myself. But so often what I see in, in politics mm -hmm. is this house of cards mentality, mm -hmm. where I'm only going to support it if I benefit politically. Mm -hmm. And to me, serving in office isn't the end goal. The end goal is to make the best decision for the country. You mentioned several times making the best decision. So how do you define the best decision? So what I do is I put all kind of political benefit aside. Mm -hmm. right? I, I, I'll make a decision even if it hurts me politically, if I think it's right. And I've done that. And, and if you read about me in Palazzo City Council, you'll see that's what I do. Um, so I've, I've, that's the first thing. I think a lot of, a lot of people in politics... So political correct is not important for you? It's not, no, not political correctness. That's not what I'm, talk, what I'm talking about is um, a lot of times people will vote for something, only support it if they will benefit, benefit from it themselves directly, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you've ever watched Netflix, House of Cards, but I, I started watching that. And on House of Cards, you see the people who are serving the country, at least in that show, and with their... And the way they decide on things is only if they get this benefit, only if they get some sort of political benefit. That's uh, fiction, right? It's fiction, it's fiction. Yeah. But it maybe it's a little bit about reality as well. But mm -hmm. so often people, I mean, I see a little bit on city council as well, where only if they get some sort of political benefit mm -hmm. do people vote for it. Yeah. And, and to me, I'm not a professional politician. Mm -hmm. I am a, at heart, I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said I'm kind of nerdy in some ways, still nerdy. Um, for me, it's we should put how I will benefit politically aside, mm -hmm. right? Because really, what, what's more important to me mm -hmm. is looking at an issue from all perspectives. Mm -hmm. I go out of my way. Yeah. I, so I, every Sunday, I have office hours. Mm -hmm. And I look at issues from every perspective. I talk to people that disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Like, so for instance, on Monday, we have, a, we have a item, item 12 on the on agenda, to look at how do we cut down on um, anti-hate speech. Or racism, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's and really it, important issue. It's an important issue, but it's very mm, controversial. Very yeah, we had an event last year. You joined us with last, yeah. Yeah, but it's a very, it's a very controversial topic because mm -hmm. it's balancing freedom of speech exactly. with racism and, yes. and hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And so how do we handle it, right? Yes. So uh, I know it's controversial, mm -hmm. and I invited people who strongly disagree with me on this, mm -hmm. and I, I live stream it, right? Mm -hmm. By talking to people you disagree with, you actually mm -hmm. understand the issue more, and then you can make a better decision because... Some of the stuff they say is going to be correct, mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to be wrong on it, and I need to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, how you make good decisions, right? Yes, but so often, right, yes. people don't want to talk to people that yeah, disagree with them. Listen to people, especially the people who have the different op yes. opinion with you. Yes. Sometimes even the, you know, something you know, really against you, but yeah. you still open your heart and listen to them, right? Absolutely. Uh, so the last question is, what if, what if you fail? Are you going to run again? If I fail, you know, I, I've already seen some change, you know? So mm -hmm. since I've been running... I, uh, I had my, my colleagues, my Asian American electeds, they told me that the current representative has gone out of her way to be a lot more responsive. And so I've seen, you know, so I, just by running, I've seen, I've seen changes, right? I've seen, I, and so I'm, I'm, I'm like, 
Uh, people told me, Greg, even if you don't win, I'm, I've, you've already benefited us because I, before she never showed up at my campaign event. Now she shows up at my campaign event. And I'm like, great, you know, that's awesome, right? Um, she returns their calls now. That's great. You know, she's been historically very hard to be very, very inaccessible. But now there's me running, there's you know, like, you know, I guess seven hours running against her. And so she's been, like, she's been everywhere. She's been more responsive than she's been, you know, in the past 10 years. And that's great, you know? So for me, I'm going to see what happens. If I mm -hmm. win, that's great. You know, I'll mm -hmm. try to serve and best of my capabilities. Mm -hmm. And if I don't win, we'll see what happens in terms mm -hmm. of do I, do I see changes. Some of the things I'm campaigning on, like nuclear power, yes, hopefully yes. we'll see some change because, you know, right now, without nuclear power, it's like going to battle mm -hmm. against climate change with one harm time behind your mm -hmm. back. Nuclear power provides 20% of our energy. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest knob we could turn to cut down our carbon output. Mm -hmm. But the current comment is really against nuclear. And I think it's wrong. So I'm hoping just by campaigning, right? And if I don't win, it will, it will ho hopefully cause her to... Yeah, raise some yeah, tension. Yes, yeah, raise some right. tension. Yeah, I, you know, personally, I really like uh, Miss um, Anna Eshel. So I actually do too as uh, well. Yeah, I heard her speech and it's yeah. very inspiring. Yes. So, but, you know, I'm so glad that you decided to do this and uh, serve our community, especially, you know, the slogan, uh, a legislator for the digital age. Yeah, that's really important, especially sure. for our next generation. So thank you for yeah, sharing with us. Yes. Thank you for uh, your time. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I hope that next time you, you will invite you back and uh, uh, speak on our, our forum. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.